Welcome back to Monument Valley, where the perils of boundary retracement lurk in every corner. As our story continues, we find our noteworthy crew at a point in the Parker deed along the tree bridge line, 1,700 feet southerly from the north line of section six. This is the end of the first leg of the Parker deed. The graphic will refresh our memory and help us reorient to the Parker description. From here, Parker's deed turns to the west on a new heading. Reading from Parker's deed, the next instruction is, thence south, 89, 30, west, 660 feet. As displayed in the graphic, the description is en route to a certain gauging station. To our party chief, getting there appears to be straightforward once he gets pointed in the right direction. And what is the right direction? This is the first mention of a bearing in Parker's description. Although the word southerly was used earlier along the tree bridge line, this term is too general to properly orient the deed. The chain person notices something interesting, however. Here is what she discovers. The subdivision map, partially shown, indicates the bearing north, zero, 30 west for its east line. Further, we recall that the lines of the subdivision bear at right angles to each other. And since the present course of Parker's deed runs along a bearing of south, 89, 30 west, this puts us exactly at right angles to the subdivision map. A brilliant piece of detective work. The chain person has found a bearing correlation between Parker's subdivision map and his deed. With this correlation, why can't we assume that the basis of bearing in Parker's deed was meant to be his east line as shown on his subdivision map or vice versa? Bearing in mind, the subdivision map was recorded 15 years after his deed. To answer this, we must remind ourselves of the fundamental premise of deed interpretation, that the language of a deed is controlled by its written terms and all terms of the deed are assumed to be present. If Parker's description had called out the bearing shown on his subdivision map for the tree bridge line, we would base the consecutive courses upon that bearing, and this would preserve a right angle where the deed turns to the west. But we are always required to base the bearings upon the first course where a particular bearing is given. If this first course falls along a monumented line, its direction would be dictated by found monuments controlling the deed. Without monuments, the assumed direction of the second course, south 89, 30 west, is based upon astronomic north. In the event that a basis of bearings is not stated or otherwise implied in a deed, astronomic bearings should be assumed. The field crew performs a solar observation to provide the needed basis of bearing. Once a basis of bearing has been adopted, it applies to all courses following unless a new basis of bearings is stated or implied. Therefore, Parker's next two courses are based upon astronomic north. The actual deed instructions are as follows. Thence south, 0, 30 east, 300 feet. Thence south, 89, 30 west, 900 feet, to Logan's gauging station. The phrase to Logan's gauging station begins with one of the most important words in land surveying. It's a little word, but it demands a lot. To requires that both the bearing and the distance given beforehand, in this case, south 89, 30 west, 900 feet, yield to the object described. In a deed, objects called out are the same as monuments. Monuments, whether they are natural objects or artificial ones, such as iron pipes, always take precedence over mathematical information. Therefore, the crew's next pursuit will be to find the gauging station. When they find it, the center of the station will be taken as the deed position, since no other intent is specified in the wording. 
Their ground search reveals suspect remains. A cylindrical shaft suspended in the air, supported by a set of metal brackets affixed to a large rock in the cliff. Shown in part is Baltimore's Platte, drawn in 1905, the same year as Parker's Deed, showing a tie to a gauging station in existence at that time. Baltimore does not refer to it as Logan's gauging station, as stated in Parker's Deed. Is Baltimore's angle tie sufficient to relocate the gauging station he shows on his map? Remember that an obliterated corner may be reestablished using an acceptable map or plat if it depicts and indicates by measurement the original location of the corner. There is no apparent reason to reject Baltimore's plat as an acceptable map, although this does not mean it should not be heavily scrutinized. All maps and records, even if they are modern and seem reliable, should be thoroughly examined in all parts. A source's reliability and a surveyor's liability are forever interlocked. Noting these warnings, our party chief decides to tie the cylindrical shaft held by the metal braces and compare this position to the right angle tie shown on Baltimore's map. His measurement corroborates Baltimore's tie line to within two feet. Evidently, Baltimore's gauging station coincides with the cliff remains. Are these remains, then, the same as Logan's gauging station described in Parker's deed? It is possible to corroborate this further by computing the position of the station itself using the course information contained in the Parker description itself. When this is done, a 45-foot discrepancy results. In this case, it would be a good idea to solicit testimony from area residents that the cliff remains are indeed those of a unique gauging station that existed in this area of the river around 1905. Unlike the earlier principle that refuted Baltimore's monument on the bridge because it was not called for in the description, here there exists no boundary principle based upon the available evidence that requires the cliff remains to be refuted as the gauging station. Backed into this corner, the party chief cannot escape a dilemma. Are these the remains of the station, or aren't they? The jury inside his head takes a few moments to deliberate. He accepts Baltimore's plat as corroborating evidence for the obliterated gauging station. He accepts the visible remains as primary evidence. He can find none of the area residents to assert otherwise. The next course of the Parker deed is not as easy to retrace. It reads, Thence along the top of the left bank of the river, north 46, 30, west, 200 feet. In the graphic shown, this course is seen leaving the gauging station, coming to an angle point which then turns the Parker boundary to the west. Moving to the next graphic, we see a detail of the area near the terminus of this course. Here the chainman finds the tail end of a retaining wall overlooking the river. The wall bears the date 1935 scribed on its top. Next to the date is a brass plug set in concrete bearing the stamp City Engineer. The crew suspects that the wall is a public works project, and where there are public works, there are public survey notes. The chain person is dispatched to the country store, where she begins a telephone search for more information. During her research, the chainman, who has remained at the site, discovers three more monuments near the city engineer's desk. A three-quarter inch iron pipe with a brass disc that is partially obscured, an open two-inch iron pipe, and a two-by-two -two wooden stake. Examining the subdivision map in the vicinity of this point, the chief notes that a two-by-two -two redwood stake was originally set here for the subdivision. His first guess 
is that this found two by two stake is the original. He carefully removes the stake from the ground, replacing it with a nail to hold its position. Inspecting the stake carefully, he notes its deteriorated condition. At that moment, the chain person returns with a map from the city engineer's office, which was sent via the general store's fax machine. Isn't technology wonderful? A detail of the city engineer's map shows clearly the replacement of the original subdivision corner. Drawn by the city engineer, there appears to be little to dispute, except for the other monuments. So what do we have? One, a city engineer's disc, thought to be the replacement of an original subdivision monument, but in conflict with, two, a redwood stake suggestive of being very old, together with, three, an open two-inch iron pipe that, for all we know, might be a sleeve to hold a real estate sign, and four, a three-quarter inch iron pipe set by an unknown engineer. The situation of multiple monuments is a fairly common occurrence. Conflicts between monuments should be resolved by using the one that best satisfies written intents and or can best be linked with the original using corroborative evidence. In the absence of identifiable original corners, corners such as those in the present story are near the bottom of the list as acceptable controlling evidence. What is the least acceptable evidence? That evidence left by improvements built soon after the original monumentation. What do we do if, by these standards, two monuments have equal credentials as a corner? The monument in best agreement with record angle, distance, or area should be used when deciding between conflicting monuments of otherwise equal status. However, this is not a case of choosing between monuments in a subdivision. What is being retraced is Parker's deed, not the subdivision. Although the two appear to represent the same piece of land, one cannot be used to reestablish the other. Why? Because a subdivision creates lots that are conveyed by action of a survey defined by monuments. Subdivision monuments are set to subdivide a piece of land within an ownership. They do not control the original conveyance that created the land being subdivided. Although the city engineer's disk might be used to control this particular corner of the subdivision, where do we place the corresponding corner of the Parker deed? We are permitted to use the written terms of the deed only. Therefore, following the deed literally, the party chief calculates a traverse from the remains of the gauging station along the course north, 46, 30 west, 200 feet. Using the basis of bearing established by the solar observation, he finds this position on the ground and compares it to the four monuments in question. Unfortunately, the point falls short of the wall and into the river. We note that the point does not fall on the, quote, top of the left bank of the river, unquote, as stated in the Parker deed. Are we bound to the top of the bank as a natural monument called for? Would this lead us to consider one of the other points as better evidence? The bank of the river is presumed to be ephemeral, subject to alteration by floodwaters and erosion. If the sudden loss of part of the bank, known as evulsion, were to occur, it would not constitute a change in the original deed boundary. An evulsion does not change boundaries. Local residents and records in the County Historical Society Museum confirm that floods occurring in 1910 wreaked havoc on the banks of the river, and that the retaining wall built in 1935 was the last of a series of public works designed to bring the river under control. Therefore, the bearing and the distance from the gauging station remains the best evidence of the location of the bank of the river before the flood. Let's continue now with Parker's next course. We go thence south, 8930 west, to the Cliff Road. 
thence along the cliff road. I need to interrupt the description here in mid-sentence just for a moment. These courses bring our field surveyors to and along the cliff road. The bearings continue to be astronomic. This part of the river is characterized by a deep 100-foot chasm through solid rock. The road runs along the top of the cliff and is clearly the only road that has ever existed along the cliff. In the absence of modifiers to clarify the intent, such as to the first edge of the road, and so on, we must use the center of the roadbed for the deed line. The road may or may not turn abruptly, as indicated by the map. Although the map may depict the road, it only serves to clarify. It is not part of the legal description. The true shape of Parker's boundary would include any curves in the road's alignment. The wording along the cliff road, which was interrupted just a moment ago, continues now with a very important qualifying phrase, which reads as follows. To the west line of the easterly 400 feet of the west half of section 6, being the southeast corner of land conveyed to B. Ketchum by deed in the year 1900. This is a double call, citing both the land of a certain Ketchum and the easterly 400 feet of the west half of the section. This sets the stage for possible conflicting terms. The call to Ketchum's land implies that its east line should be the west line of the easterly 400 feet. That's fine, providing it does. Our party chief should verify this before proceeding and should not be surprised to find Ketchum's land described differently within the section. Until we know more, Ketchum's land may or may not enjoy senior rights. Senior rights are those rights held by landowners who obtain title earlier than an adjoining party. The adjoiner yielding to the senior title has the junior rights. Between adjoiners, the senior deed is usually the one recorded first, but the date of recordation is not the only factor used to establish senior rights. The date of agreement, as well as the date of execution, may come under close inspection by title companies or the court. Between any two adjoiners, there is always a senior and junior title, except for simultaneous conveyances in which case there is no distinction. Forever on his toes, the party chief inspects Ketchum's deed and finds that Ketchum's deed actually abuts the west line of the easterly 3,040 feet of the section. Therefore, Ketchum's east line depends upon the east line of the section, not the north-south center line as stated in Parker's description. However, there is always the possibility that Ketchum's description is incorrect. A call to an adjoiner does not necessarily indicate senior rights. A chain of title obtained from a title company is necessary to determine junior-senior rights. If the legal description in Ketchum's deed were to hold up as senior in the title search, it will become necessary to survey the east line of Section 6 to retrace Parker's deed. For the time being, Ketchum's east line will need to remain uncertain. We do not have enough information about the east line of the section at this time. The crew continues with the next instruction in Parker's deed, which tells them to go thence northerly along Ketchum's east line to Highway 10. They follow an old north-south fence until it intersects the highway right-of-way fence. A specific point on or in the highway to go to is not expressed in this wording. Do we stop at the sideline or proceed to the center line of the road to name two possibilities? The chainman combs through the research package to find an early highway document recorded in 1880, an easement to the county for highway purposes along a certain Highway 10 granted by the original landowner of all of Section 6 the Flyer Railroad Company. Calls to a road are to the center line 
if the grantor owns the underlying fee in the road unless the road itself is specifically excluded. The term Highway 10 is also potentially ambiguous. Checking his research package for other highway alignments that might have been granted or dedicated since the 1880 document, the party chief confirms for himself that modern Highway 10 wasn't created by deed until 1930 and is therefore not relevant to Parker's description. Unfortunately, the 1880 easement document did not specify a width or a mathematical position for the highway. For the sake of a good story, which of course this one is, let's pretend that neither a map nor a description exists for that old highway. Then it becomes useless to belabor the question, where is the 1880 highway? It is possible that it is lost forever. Every once in a while, a road will fall through the cracks. Not everything in the world is retraceable. Proceeding with Parker's description, however uncertain it may be in places, it next instructs the crew to go thence along said Highway 10 to the north-south center line of Section 6. They are brought to a line they have up to now been able to avoid. To determine the location of the north-south center line of Section 6, they will need to establish the north and south quarter corners of the section. I talked earlier about how to establish the north quarter corner, which is the northwest corner of Lot 2. The south quarter corner, if intact, is the other point the crew needs. If it is gone, their search will need to branch out to the section corners west and east of it. Unfortunately, they cannot find the south quarter corner after a diligent search. The chainman hikes off to the east to look for the southeast section corner, finding a 1915 brass cap there. Meanwhile, the chain person explores the line to the west, finding another 1915 brass cap on the range line. From a single control point, the party chief can tie both of these section corners, as well as reset the south quarter corner at its proportional position along the 1915 line. Suddenly, it's everybody's lucky day. In land surveying, one gradually learns to suspect that which comes too easily. The chief warily inspects the 1915 U.S. GLO plat, showing the south line of section 6. Standard brass caps were set at each of the corners. However, the situation at the southeast corner is a little strange. A set stone in a stone mound was found there in 1915 and perpetuated with a brass cap, showing that some original monumentation from the original 1870 survey was found along the south line. Perhaps a diligent search will turn up something that the 1915 survey missed. The original field notes for this south line of section 6 describe what was set. The southwest corner, a wood stake in an earth mound, would be expected to lose favor with the elements rather quickly. The southeast corner, a set stone, which at that time was adjacent to a tree, would also need very good luck to survive. Fortunately, it was found in 1915 and perpetuated. The south quarter corner holds more promise. The notes call for a sizable stone with a mound as well. The 1915 USGLO dependent survey of Section 6 was ordered by the government to, quote, follow in the footsteps, unquote, of the 1870 survey, not to supersede it. It occurs to our party chief that just because the 1915 survey failed to recover two out of three of the original 1870 monuments, it is not necessarily true that those original monuments are gone from the face of the earth. While the other crew members watch, he scours a badly bouldered mountain, heavy with brush, for evidence of the original 1870 south quarter corner, and, sure enough, discovers two possible candidates. One, a circular ring of stones, half embedded in the earth, with a 19 by 12 by 11 inch stone 
lying five feet downhill, the other a three-foot diameter, two-foot high pile of rocks with an iron stake driven into the ground through its center. These are some 50 feet apart. He picks through the mounds carefully, looking for possible accessory evidence. In land surveying, we leave no stone unturned. It dawns on the chainman, and he passes his idea along to his chief of party, that they might test these corners by comparing them with topographic calls contained in the original 1870 notes, if any. It turns out that the 1870 notes do contain distance measurements to topography east and west of the subject quarter corner. As detailed in the notes, the 1870 government surveyors surveying from east to west started at the southeast section corner, encountered a ridge at 30 chains bearing northwest. At 50 chains, they encountered a stream. These are two easily recognized landforms. Using the found corners of the 1915 survey as an approximate guide for the original 1870 line, the crew finds the ridge and stream to lie at distances which fit the 1870 survey notes very well, within 10 or 20 feet. The exact positions for the ridge and stream are difficult to locate. This is typical of topographic calls. Measurements are, at best, within 5 or 10 feet. Using the topographic calls, the crew can place the quarter corner at the proper proportional distance between the rocky ridge and the stream. For the south line of a typical section 6, the quarter corner would be placed at 40 chains, in this case, the midpoint of the rocky ridge and stream. The principal facts favoring the northwesterly circular ring of stones as the original 1870 quarter corner is the proximity of the 19 by 12 by 11 inch stone to the circular ring and its position near the midline of the ridge and stream. However, this latter condition of position need not be met. From the source, Restoration of Lost or Obliterated Corners, we have the following fundamental dictate for sectionalized land surveys. The original township, section, and quarter section corners, but not closing corners, must stand as the true corners which they were intended to represent, whether in the place shown by the field notes or not. In addition to this, we need a way to positively identify a corner. A corner's acceptability, in the absence of other evidence, can be based upon its likeness to the original corner. The Manual of Instructions states three conditions. One, the character and dimensions of the monument in evidence should not be widely different from the record. And two, the markings in evidence should not be inconsistent with the record and three, the nature of the accessories in evidence, including size, position, and markings, should not be greatly at variance with the record. And what if there were no topographic calls and no mounds of stone? In the absence of all other evidence, the reestablishment of lost government corners must be done by a mathematical method of proportionate measure. A lost corner is restored according to the type of corner it is, that is, standard section corner, quarter corner, closing corner, township corner, township corner on a curve parallel, meander corner, and so on. The field notes govern the actual procedure by which a lost corner must be replaced, and some of the procedures are not always obvious, such as three-way positioning, or re-establishing section lines with angle points. Failure to consult the notes. When restoring a lost corner by mathematical methods is risky business. On the exam, expect unusual, tricky circumstances like meander corners and closing corners on rancho lines. Remember that an obliterated corner is never re-established by mathematical proportion. Only a lost corner is. A thorough surveyor will exhaust every possibility that a lost corner is not actually an obliterated corner. 
using proportionate measure to reestablish an original corner should be done only as a last resort. It should be stressed that the use of topography requires very careful consideration. When used with the method of proportionate measure, topography may not be conclusive in situations where the degree of measurement certainty is poor. Where topography calls prove inconclusive, proportionate measure must be used. In a case like this, a surveyor should consult with the BLM, but for now, we will accept the quarter corner stone backed up by the topo evidence. Let's finish out the last two courses of Parker's description. Thence, northerly, along said north-south center line, to the north quarter corner of section six. Thence, easterly, to the true point of beginning. Having completed a full retracement of Parker's deed, our weary crew is disappointed that little evidence concerning the boundary of the subdivision has turned up. There is scant to go by to establish the interior corners. Reconstruction of the interior monuments of the subdivision from its boundary monuments may not be an effective strategy, particularly in older subdivisions. Subdivision corners should be reestablished from the closest available monuments inside the subdivision. Original interior monuments will hold in all situations, whereas original monuments on the boundary are subject to the effects of tidal discrepancy. Finally, reminding himself that a correct survey of the Sundance Ranch partnership deed depends solely on the north and east lines of Parker's deed, the party chief decides to see where these corners fall inside the subdivision. Recalling that great overlap which had formed against the east line of the subdivision, our party chief suspects that this overlap likewise shifts the deeded location of the Sundance Ranch as owned by the partnership 50 feet to the west relative to where it is shown on the subdivision map. He confirms this by computing the corners of the Sundance Ranch partnership deed and placing temporary ground nails. These nails fall in the 60-foot road west of the ranch, nearly to the east line of Lot 8. At the same time, this shift opens a 50-foot fissure on the other side. Who owns the land within this easterly gap? Subdivision lot lines are not extended beyond the original monuments in cases where the original subdivider failed to subdivide all his land. Title to the unsubdivided land is in the original subdivider. The land is probably still in the estate of Parker. Who owns the land within the overlap on the west side? This falls in a dedicated street. The land in this street was not in the original title of the subdivider. Therefore, it cannot be conveyed by virtue of the monumentation of the subdivision. Consequently, only the west 10 feet of the 60-foot road was actually created by the subdivision map. This does not mean that the owners of the subdivision lots would be forbidden to use this road, as they may have an unwritten right in the road. Remember always that the rules of unwritten title may apply upon examination by the court. The apparent shift in location of the ranch property in relation to the monumented ranch per the subdivision should not deter our crew from continuing their search for original subdivision monuments. They need the subdivision monuments to define the access road to the Sundance Ranch. As our crew searches for the original monumentation, we'll keep track of their progress by looking at graphics based upon the subdivision map. Keep in mind that the actual location of the ranch is shifted 50 feet to the west of its position on the maps we are viewing. With a measure of luck, the crew stumbles upon an old redwood hub at the apparent northwest corner of the Sundance Ranch, as shown on the subdivision map. And, finding an axle near the northeast corner of the ranch, things begin to fall into place. 
the distance and direction between this car axle and the old redwood hub fits the map well. The chain person succeeds in obtaining the help of the owners of lots three and four, enabling the crew to add to their list of found monuments another axle at the southwest corner of the ranch, as well as four other original monuments on the boundary of lots three and four, all of which are redwood hubs except the northwest corner of lot three, which is an iron pin. The owner of lot three is curious about the location of his southeast corner. Let's digress for a moment and demonstrate the specific manner in which the southeast corner of lot three would be reestablished, assuming it is lost. Between the subdivision map and the field measurements, we observe a difference of 4.5 feet in the overall length of the combined east lines of lots three and four. This difference should be distributed among the lots along the line formed by the found monuments in accordance with the principle of proration. Excess or deficiency in measurement of a straight line between fixed monuments within a subdivision is distributed among all the lots along the line in proportion to their record measurements. When subdivision lots are created by a map, all the lots are created simultaneously, even though actual conveyances of the lots may occur at different times at later dates. There is no senior or junior title distinction. Since no senior rights exist, mathematical proration becomes the only equitable way to distribute excesses or deficiencies in measurement. Lot three therefore receives more of the excess due to its longer line. Excess or deficiency cannot be distributed beyond any original found monument in a subdivision. For example, in a typical block, original monuments found at A, B, and C enable us to set any of the intermediate points between them. Corners at D and E would not qualify for proration based upon the monuments found. However, the monuments at A and B might be used to control the direction of the north line of the block. In this way, corners D and E may be partially controlled by A and B. Monuments set beyond the original title line of the subdivider's property can control the direction of lines within the subdivision, much like government closing corners. The direction of the south line of lot three is controlled by the monument set for the southeast corner of lot three, even though the true corner falls on the tree bridge line. Therefore, the south line of lot three cannot go all the way to the apparent east line of the subdivision map. That's 50 feet past the subdivider's original ownership. As suggested by the graphic, we would expect to find the original subdivision monuments set about 50 feet east of the tree bridge line. But life is full of things we least expect. Returning to the progress of our surveyors, their measurements show that the subdivision was in fact monumented only 1.5 feet east of the tree bridge line, not 50 feet. The north and south lines of lots three and four should be 660 feet long according to the subdivision map. These lots are actually about 50 feet narrower on the ground. The party chief concludes that the east line of lots three and four were monumented according to Parker's deed to within about 1.5 feet anyway. But the balance of the subdivision to the west was monumented 50 feet to the east. Regardless, the original monuments within the subdivision still hold for the lots they were intended to define except for the senior rights of the Sundance Ranch, of course. The chain person notices that the northeast corner of lot three has been set about four feet past the north line of Parker's deed into section 31. Her first inclination is to assume that the lot, as monumented, is cut off by the section line. Fortunately, she has been studying diligently for the land surveyor's exam and retains a number of obscure principles in her head. She points out to the party chief that if Parker, the original subdivider, also owned this land in section 31 
at the time he filed his subdivision, then he would have passed title to the land as monumented, even though it might have been monumented in error. The chief of party, disbelieving and somewhat ruffled, takes a long, slow breath and combs through his favorite boundary surveying reference, where he finds that his chain person is indeed correct. As it turns out, Parker did own the southeast quarter of Section 31 at the time he filed his subdivision. So, Lot 3 ends up with a projection on its north line, which lies 4.2 feet north of the north line of Section 6, and a foot and a half past the tree bridge line. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, let's take a look at what is available for locating the 60-foot road access to the Sundance Ranch. Remember, the road is part of the survey the crew has been assigned to perform, and the road is defined by the subdivision map. The graphic shown holds some promise for doing this. Getting started, the party chief examines the possibilities presented by the axle at the northeast corner of the ranch. First of all, he checks the overall distance between the northerly and southerly controlling monuments on the east side of lots 2 and 5, and finds that it differs from the subdivision map by over 12 feet, but that's not unusual for older subdivisions. Of particular interest is whether the axle fits a prorated position on this line. Before testing this, he reminds himself that the position of this monument may be immaterial. Only original lines or their replacements can control original lines and subdivisions. In the absence of any proof of occupying the same position as the original corner, the party chief determines that the axle should not be used for proration or line direction. The westerly lines of lots three and four, in this case, would be controlled by the two monuments known to be originals at the north and south ends. Assuming the sidelines of the 60-foot road are lost, reestablishing the points where they intersect the east line of lots 2 and 5 would fall to the method of proration, provided the privately owned lots bear the full brunt of the excess or deficiency. Why? Dedicated streets are in the public ownership, so certain principles apply. In the absence of monumentation, their widths remain as stated on the map. On the other hand, remember that monuments always control the map. If original street monuments are recovered, they will control the width of the street, whether in agreement with the subdivision map or not. For the situation at hand, the factor of proration to apply to the east lot lines of lots 2 and 5 requires that we first subtract the two 60-foot road widths to leave them out of the calculation. Each of the private lots will receive a proportional share of the excess or deficiency. Now for an academic question. Should the Sundance Ranch, which is shown as not a part on the subdivision map, also receive a proportional share of the excess along with lots 2 and 5? I will leave this brain teaser to you as a workbook exercise. As it is with resurveys of sectionalized land, proration of subdivision lots is the rule of last resort. It must always yield to the discovery of original monuments. No sooner is this said that our field crew finds an original two by two redwood stake next to the axle. This original monument supersedes the prorated position. With renewed excitement, the chainman digs around the southeast and southwest corners of the ranch. At the southwest corner, next to the earlier found axle, he turns up the trace remains of an old redwood stake two feet down. As more originals come to light, other factors controlling the reestablishment of street lines begin to develop. Proration may no longer be tenable in instances where the subdivision map shows straight or parallel lines. We also have the statement on the subdivision map that certain lines bear at right angles to each other. Considering these various options, our party chief decides to reconstruct the 60-foot road parallel to the north line of the ranch 
as recovered by the original subdivision monuments found on that line. In doing this, he is asserting that no other monumentation exists to place the road. This is consistent with the reestablishment of positions according to the rules of evidence as they apply to lost and obliterated corners. The evidence in this case is the subdivision map itself. The survey is not yet completed, but the hour is growing late. An approaching thunderstorm will arrive any minute. Our dogged crew packs the equipment into the truck. The maps and deeds, scattered everywhere, are stacked, folded, enrolled, and placed into the briefcase. The chain person is gathering loose papers from the cab when she notices a small, reduced assessor's map lying between the seats. It has become detached from a title report. Written across Lot 8 is a barely readable reference to a record of survey. Unfortunately, this record of survey is not contained among the research materials. The party chief races to the county records center just before closing. And there it is, a complete survey of Lot 8, filed as a record of survey in 1940. At that time, the entire boundary was recovered from original monuments. As explained on the record of survey, each found original was perpetuated with a three-quarter inch iron pipe with a one-quarter inch disc bearing the surveyor's registration. The crew's work concerning the 60-foot road is, of course, superseded by this evidence. With this map as a basis, they are able to reestablish the 60-foot road with confidence the following week. The moral of this story is that the harder lessons of land surveying are avoided by better research and organization. Put in a more immediately relevant way, successful passage to the other side of the land surveyor's exam will demonstrate as effectively as any tough survey your ability to perform effective analysis of evidence and to apply your analysis to the boundary problems in an efficient, organized fashion. You should not take the exam without thoroughly knowing the BLM manual and at least one of the popular boundary references, several of which are noted in the reference section of the workbook. A good rule for effective exam preparation is, it is better to know one good source thoroughly so you can find what you're looking for quickly than to flounder through many you haven't had time to read in detail. Test problems involving boundary principles can, can appear quite complex on the surface. Only the poorly prepared are intimidated by these. Become thoroughly familiar with your research materials before you sit for the exam. Perform the mini research needed before solving each problem. Each boundary problem is usually composed of a set of smaller associated problems. Pick the problem apart to expose its inner components. I would like to paraphrase a surveyor of note, Henry David Thoreau, whose sage advice applies very well to the examinee. When you find yourself laboring in the complexities of a test problem, just remember to simplify, simplify, simplify. To this, I might add another principle that should make the test easy to pass. The last principle of this lesson. Study, study, study.